All right. I have broken things down into five basic organ segments. I know there are a lot of them. I, I told you three years I've been working on this. Okay, but I also uh, put some icons in so that you can see some basic facts about every case. So 37 of the 50 cases we will look at have our motor vehicle collisions, and that will be designated with that uh, green triangle. The other causes, well, we have the typical uh, guns and knives. Actually, that's not a knife, it's a screwdriver. Uh, we have a soccer mishap, and then we've got a bull, a horse, a doctor, and a woman. So those are the potential uh, the sources of these traumas. I also went to the National Center for Biometric Information and pulled the expected mortalities for every one of these injuries. So you'll see that with each one. And then uh, whether or not the patient lived is certainly an item of interest. So a deceased patient will be designated with that ghoulish skull icon. And then whether the radiologist actually made the call or not, did they see the finding? That'll be a, a red X if the radiologist missed the finding like Miss Othmar used to put on your grade school tests. So what this ends up is we have iconized all these things for every one of these uh, entities, and you'll see those at the bottom of the screen. So if you ever think, hey, did this guy make it? You just look to the bottom and you'll be able to see the icon. All right, a couple cases of bronchial rupture. Uh, this one is very, this is the classic, right? Where you can see there is pneumomediastinum, there's a pneumothorax, there's extensive soft tissue gas, extrathoracic soft tissue gas, and then there is complete collapse of the left lower lobe. You don't see any air bronchograms in that left lower lobe, and it's very completely atelectatic. So this is kind of the, the classic appearance of these. Right here, you can actually, uh, when we mag it up, you can actually follow the left uh, lower lobe bronchus down to this, and then you'll lose it. Right. The other thing I'd like to point out is the, the rib fractures here kind of bracket the left hemithorax. When I see rib fractures in this kind of orientation, I used to say, oh, it means diaphragmatic rupture every time. Actually, I've seen it associated now with esophageal injuries um, and uh, bronchial injuries as well as diaphragmatic. But when I see, again, these kind of bracketing rib fractures, I get concerned about all of those sorts of injuries and go looking for them. So here we can, uh, we'll slow this down. You can actually follow that left lower lobe bronchus and you just kind of lose it before it ever enters that atelectatic left lower lobe. So some of you may remember that we, uh, many years ago, 2006, 2007, we had people come out to my office in Tucson and, and train on our system. And I remember one time we had a, a, one of our radiologists, her name was Connie, she came out and we were working on coronary CTA and I'd gotten the coolest case of coronary uh, occlusion, a right coronary occlusion. And I, I said, oh, everybody, come on in. I just got the greatest case right here. I just called it in, a right coronary occlusion. They're taking him to the cath lab. And I said, Connie, why don't you sit down and, and scroll through it with us? And Connie sat down at my desk and she started scrolling and she looked up at me and said, this guy's got a PE. And I said, I have to make a call. <laughs> so when I came across this case, I actually read the follow-up to this. It was about two days later. And this guy had blown up like the Michelin man. I mean, it was not challenging, right? He'd been on mechanical ventilation for about 48 hours with a completely transected lower lobe bronchus. So his whole body was just about to float away like a balloon. And I looked at the prior, which was this, and it had been read by Connie. And so I called Connie up and I said, hey, I think you missed a left lower lobe bronchial rupture. And there was this pause and she said, is this because of that PE? <laughs> So this one is a little bit less classic in that it's far enough out that it did not cause pneumomediastina, but it certainly caused a pneumothorax. And obviously we have a disruption of, this one is the uh, bronchus intermedius. So, you know, I, I, as I told you, my particular expertise was the right mainstem bronchus intubation. 
And I used to say, you know, I take a lot of ribbing from my ER colleagues, but I said, what, what's the problem? Big deal. When it happens, I pull it back. Nobody's hurt, right? Well, actually, then I saw this case and thought, whew, I was getting away with it time and time again, because that's what happened to this patient. That's why I've got a physician down here as the cause of the injury. Uh, this was an attempted intubation. They went in too far, main stemmed him, and tore the bronchus intermedius. And this is a really nice view on the coronal. You can see it right there is the defect, right past the right upper lobe bronchus takeoff. Right? And that was an intubation that uh, this guy was even more exuberant than I in his uh, right main stem intubation. The other thing that's interesting is there's a little focus of extravasation even uh, resulting from this. So it's a pretty traumatic event. You can see there it is right there, spilling into the pleural space. All right, so that's a bronchus intermedius transection. So this is about the worst lung injury I've ever seen. Of course, with direct blows, you can develop traumatic pneumatoceles, usually because of shearing. And those will present, as you can see, these gas-filled spaces. And there is also just extensive pulmonary contusion and uh, hemorrhage throughout the entire right lung. Of course, there's a pneumothorax as well. But the real drama is actually on the bone windows. I've never seen anything like that. His rib is levered up and sticking straight off his chest wall. And so I tried, to, and you can see the distortion of his right chest wall, even the soft tissues are all tenting up over that crazy rib. And I was, I was thinking all about this. How could that have happened? What did it catch on? Was it something with the airbag? Was it this or that? And I was really going to tease out the vector because we know how I love that and the distraction that it provides. Uh, so I called up the trauma manager for this case. This was in Indiana. And I said, how do you think that happened? What did it catch on? What did this and that? You know? And she says, this kid went off the road at 100 miles an hour and his car rolled sideways several times and then flipped end to end several times. She said, I don't think you're going to tease out the specific vector that resulted in that rib doing that. Uh, this guy lived fairly incredibly. She was wonderful, by the way. We sent her a VRAD mug, uh, the trauma coordinator, because she kept in touch. She texted me about every week or so. This guy was helicoptered to one of the Mayo Clinic facilities and spent about two weeks on ECMO uh, and ultimately did live. So crazy. I even, uh, the funny thing too about this was I said, what'd you do with that rib? And she said, what rib? <laughs> because you couldn't really see it uh, under the distorted soft tissues. And so she, they, they just threw him in a helicopter and sent him off. All right, so that is a quite a lung injury. And you can see why he's got that pneumothorax, right? With that rib levered up like that. All right, well, this is curious. I honestly, I didn't know this happened until fairly recently. I'd never seen one, but this is, I, it's called pulmonary herniation in most of the literature. I would call it more like a, a lung extrusion, right? This patient was compressed and just squirted a little bit of lung out between his ribs there. And you can actually see lung markings in it. And there it is. These aren't dangerous. There's literally a 0% mortality. They just poked it back in, <laughs> sewed it up. But uh, I was not aware that that sort of thing went on. Crazy. He doesn't even have much of a, he doesn't even have a pneumothorax, really. I mean, he's got a little gas anteriorly, but that's about it. So there it is again. You can see the lung markings in it. All right. So this is one, this is actually 10 days after the injury, uh, but the, I hadn't seen many pseudoaneurysms of the pulmonary arteries. Uh, that were traumatic. I've seen them certainly in a uh, result of a necrotizing pneumonia or other infections, but I thought this was interesting that this guy was hit just so perfectly, he was shot, that it created this 
pseudoaneurysm of the pulmonary artery. And this was, again, about 10 days after the injury. And you can see the tract that the bullet created very nicely. And again, the pseudoaneurysm right there. As far as I know, they left it. They decided not to address it. All right, well, this is an unusual injury and you're not gonna see many of these, uh, mainly because they almost all die at the scene. So this is actually a, this is the normal, or you can see the mediastinal density there, but that arrow is pointing at the more normal portion of the SVC. And then posteriorly, all this is a venous pseudoaneurysm. And so again, these just don't typically make it. In fact, the NCBI says this is almost 100% fatal. And so this patient actually survived to get to the hospital and uh, went to surgery. But the surgeon said, look at all that blood in the mediastinum, right? And it's pretty incredible. And as you follow that SVC down, you can see how large that pseudoaneurysm really is. So the surgeon said, uh, as soon as they opened this up, it just let loose. And you know they were unable to get control of it. And so uh, this patient died very quickly. So almost universally fatal. And again, in stark contrast to the IVC, right? The IVC mortality is pretty bad, but incredibly enough, they just don't tend to operate on them. And I've got four or five people in here that survived IVC lacerations. All right. Uh, I was recently at the ASER conference, and they loved to make a point about the fact that if you see a fracture in an ankylosing spondylitis patient, you should look at the rest of the spine. It's the MS of trauma, right? You should go and look at all the rest of the spine because they frequently will fracture in more than just one place. And that was the case here. But this patient actually has a sternal fracture associated with his ankylosing spondylitis fracture. And you can see that by that fluid density in the anterior mediastinum there, and there is the sternal fracture. And of course, here is the thoracic spine fracture. Hard to see on the axials. Of course, nobody is just looking at the spine on axials, especially in traumas, right? And if you see anyone who sends you a thorax, abdomen, pelvis study of any kind, but especially a trauma without the appropriate sagittal and coronal reformats, let us know, right? Nina will get on them immediately. But that is uh, a good example of this uh, same phenomenon, right? That you are rarely going to break your ankylosing spondylitis spine in just one place. And in this case, it actually was the sternum that took the other hit. Got a nice view of the sagittal. Again, you, you, know, you could see it on the axial certainly, but then you see these on the sagittal and go, oh my God, how was that not blatantly obvious on the axials? And then nice view of the sternal fracture here. Straining can be subtle. I mean, the uh, the fluid density in the anterior mediastinum here is not that striking, right? But it's certainly enough to keep looking. All right, this one. Uh, this was a gastric rupture uh, with bilateral diaphragm rupture. This is the important point, is look at the posterior aspect of the liver. As I said before, left diaphragm ruptures are not that hard to see, or at least they're not as hard the right side can be very difficult, right? You don't always get that beautiful cottage loaf phenomenon, right? Where the liver sticks up through the diaphragm and is wasted there and trapped. What more often happens is the liver goes up through the diaphragm, splits it, and then drops back down. And so the only evidence you can see of the liver's voyage into the right hemithorax is an abnormal hepatic contour. So you can see that divot right at the back of the, of the liver, and there is that tiny little slip of muscle that's the torn diaphragm. In fact, when we go to the movie, it's pretty impressive. Uh, now, this was interesting because both leaves of the diaphragm were actually ruptured, and this is the left diaphragm rupture right there. This patient also, of course, had a gastric rupture. 
And you can see the fluid and uh, gas there in the upper abdomen. And you can actually see the defect here in a second. So there's another groove in the posterior liver. And again, see that little slip of muscle right behind it. Right? And then there's a lot of gas there adjacent to this gastric rupture. It's up there on the lesser curvature just below the GE junction. Again, these are really hard to spot. So we can follow the esophagus right down through all that gas and fluid, and then you see the rupture there. Okay, now look at that groove, two grooves on the back side of the liver, and you could see the little slips of diaphragm lying in them. And then there is the ruptured left hemidiaphragm. Okay, nice view. The liver contour abnormality, you can see it did get squeezed a little bit, a little pinching there like a cottage loaf sign. And then here are the disrupted remnants of the diaphragm. So on the left, you can really see that gap very nicely. And on the right, that's just residual diaphragm clinging to the rib cage there. It's mostly just disrupted. The other thing I've noticed about these is uh, there's almost always subpulmonic fluid and that will elevate the underside of the lung and often give you a little zone of compression that mimics the appearance of a diaphragm. Right? And I think that's what's going on here uh, at the base of the right lung. Okay, so there's the gastric rupture. And there's that abnormal liver contour. And watch again as we go to the back side of the liver. See that, that groove? And it's got a little slip of torn diaphragm muscle sitting in it. And here it is on the sagittal, and you can see the distortion of the liver. And probably the torn portion of the uh, diaphragm is sitting there anteriorly, right? But the whole semi-circular kind of rim there of a little bit of density is probably just compressed lung. Right? And there's a big gas collection in the mediastinum, and there's that torn left hemidiaphragm. There again is that groove, the distortion of the liver. And then we'll see that left hemidiaphragm tear right there. Very complex case. This patient, uh, they knew she had a gastric rupture. They decided to transfer her immediately, put her in a helicopter, and she did not make it. So she died probably less than 45 minutes after the scan was done. So uh, calling the diaphragm ruptures would not have changed anything, I don't believe. 